This is the Business of Esports Podcast. The fastest growing entertainment phenomenon of this generation. I, Prophet of Esports, joined today by my friend and co-host William Collis. Yeah, we got we got the book of esports out. It's a big deal. So everyone knows me as the Prophet, William as the Professor. They may call me the prophet, but in my life outside of the business of esports, I have worked on the investment side of the table for the better part of the last two decades. The single fastest growing area of gaming and esports is gambling. It's booming right now. You don't need to be a prophet like me to see that. However, as an investor, I've stayed away from gambling and betting companies because of the reputational risk and often shady nature of the companies involved. This was true until now. I've recently bought stock in a new public company called Esports Entertainment Group, or EEG, which is focused on esports and gambling. The big difference that changed my mind is that EEG is a public company, NASDAQ listed, and fully regulated, focused on esports betting. The regulatory and audit requirements of a public company are key in my mind, to provide the needed transparency for players, bettors, and investors. I had an opportunity to host the CEO of EEG on this podcast a couple of months ago, and I was very impressed by his vision for the company. We've stayed in touch, and I'm delighted to announce that they've accepted to become a sponsor of the podcast. If you're a family office, institutional investor, or investor of any kind, really, Esports Entertainment Group ticker symbol Gamble, GMBL, might be one of the best ways to get exposure to the esports betting space and gaming in general. Make sure to check them out at esportsentertainmentgroup.com. Having said that, I need to make sure to state that this is only my opinion. I'm not an investment advisor or selling stock in the company. Please make sure you do your own research and seek advice from a licensed professional if you're looking to invest in the field. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul Dewalibi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, William Collis. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do here is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for tuning in every week. Thank you for all the love, the five-star ratings and reviews. If you haven't already, go leave a review. Go leave a five-star review. Tell your friends about the podcast. Go buy William's book, The Book of Esports, uh, which you can get on Amazon. It's by far the best book in the space. Uh, And if you haven't already, go buy some Business of Esports merch. Uh, I highly recommend the socks. They're the coolest. Or the shirt I'm wearing, the From the Keyboard to the Boardroom shirt. William, I don't know why you're not wearing Business of Esports merch. I can see you. I, You know, I, I'm not kidding, Paul. <laughs> I am wearing Business of Esports socks right now. <laughs> I did the it. only That's socks true. I, I wear. And not like... only that, like I should have them. I have a little stash of socks <laughs> by my, um, by my like, you know, workstation. Because what I like to do is like, you know, just casually promote the socks when I'm on conference calls. I'll just sort of hold them up and drag <laughs> them across the screen gently. I like you know, see you if become... anyone asks anything. It's a great conversation starter. Between that and your book, you've become like a little uh, mini QVC, basically. I know. I'm 100% a QVC based, uh, you know, print, print, print and run demand shop here. So, yeah. Um, look, guys, well, let's jump into it this week. Um, we've got we've got lots of fun news to talk about. Uh, we've got uh, like great stories. But most important of all, we have an amazing, amazing guest this week. We have Kevin Wright, president of Game Square Esports. It's a publicly listed company on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Kevin, welcome to the Business of Esports podcast. Guys, I'm so excited to be here. I'm really, uh, really flattered and uh, and pleased to be joining you guys today. Um, so, Kevin, uh, for for many of our listeners uh, who tune in every week, you know, we talk a lot about uh, public gaming companies, public esports companies. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, CEOs of these companies on the podcast. Would love uh, for our listeners who don't know you or maybe don't know about Game Square 
uh, give them some of your background, uh, you know, what you're doing now in the esports world, what GameSquare is focused on. Um, any information for our listeners that gives them some context would be great. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about GameSquare first, and then I'll go into how I got involved. Um, so like you said, we're a publicly listed company. We've been listed in Canada for uh, just about five months. Uh, and the whole reason for going public was so that we could tap capital uh, as a way to first uh, drive organic growth within our company. We've got some really great assets. We're, we're closing an acquisition shortly, uh, which will further expand our agency business. Uh, and then we're also looking to do acquisitions to, uh, to grow out the business inorganically because we think that there's a ton of great assets that are out there that are undercapitalized and we think consolidation is going to be such a big part of esports going forward so you know how did i get involved in this uh uh you know i've i've, I've got some gray hairs even though uh, it may not show up on the uh, the podcast so kudos to your, can't, can't your broadcast them, software can't, can't um, see them. people can see mine but can't <laughs> cannot see yours <laughs> um but you know, my my uh, if if you go back far enough, I was playing Donkey Kong and uh, and Duck Hunt uh, before before uh, video games uh, turned into what they are today. But uh, you know, it, one of the things that I, I I find really fascinating about esports and and why I became involved in it, it's you know people will tell me it's hard to understand, but I, I don't think it is. It's this great new form of entertainment. It's just that you know my father and 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 myself may not view it as, as as a form of entertainment we want to consume, but like it is happening. And so my background, I was a programmer for a number of years um, uh, and, and, and worked my way through programming the early days of the internet uh, uh, and, and started looking out where did I want to take my future and, and, you know, jumped into business school, turned into strategy consulting internally for, for Canada's biggest uh, wireless and telecom provider. Um, and then that morphed into an opportunity to join the investment banking world. Um, and, you know, admittedly, prior to going to business school, I didn't know the job that I ended up doing was even a job that existed. Uh, I was on the research side, uh, writing reports on uh, technology companies. Uh, and then that turned into online gaming stocks, which was a really fascinating place to uh, to cut my teeth because there was so much activity within Canada. I think, you know, Canada is really good on thematic investing. Uh, and, you know, we were a major market for uh, uh, for online gaming. And and you're seeing that reemerge with uh, with esports. Uh, and so a couple of years ago when, you know, the folks at GameSquare approached me to join the company and start assessing business models, you know, it, it looked like despite, you know, for half a decade, people saying esports is coming uh, and it's the next big thing. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that I could really see that, you know, some of those catalysts had happened uh, and that we were about to uh, embark on, on a really crazy and exciting journey within esports. And so uh, I joined the company and, and, you know, I'd, I'd say the rest is history, but it's been a, a really exciting year and a half through COVID, through going public, through, you know, uh, fundraising drying up. And, and now just, you know, the market's wide open with a lot of companies coming to uh, to market. But that's all, all I, I could talk forever, having been a former analyst, but I'll, I'll let you guys uh, take over again. Uh, Kevin, I'm just curious because, you know, you mentioned consolidation being a big theme uh, that you see going forward. Um, what, what is GameSquare's strategy in a nutshell from like an M&A standpoint and, or how do you see your company sort of playing in that, in this, uh, environment of consolidation? Yeah. So the, the tagline that we, that we preach is that we're bridging the gap between global brands, uh, and the gaming and esports communities. And, and what that means is we're sitting in between major brands that are looking to invest uh, uh, and, to, and to reach through marketing dollars, this really important demographic. Uh, and then we understand how to message in an authentic way for the, uh, the brands uh, and then how to target uh, the, uh, uh, the esports audience. And, and when we look at the esports audience, we, th we think of the hardcore gamers. We're, uh, you know, nothing, nothing against some of the more casual mobile games and, you know, you and I talked about it. My 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 daughter likes playing some of these games, but she's not the target for for what uh, what our agencies are doing. And so, the space that we're playing in is the digital uh, media agencies as well as talent agencies. We think that's a really uh, great spot for our business to be. 
Um, we think there's lots of opportunities to roll in very talented, uh, really connected folks within the, uh, the, the esports and, and agency space. And most importantly, the way that we're approaching it is we, we're acquiring profitable businesses. They're either already profitable or they're just on the cusp of doing it. And what we bring to the table for them, uh, one, it's this portfolio of companies that we're uh, that we're building. Uh, we're in Europe right now and, and with the closing of our, our, our upcoming acquisition of reciprocity, uh, we'll be in the U.S. as well. So we're spanning the Atlantic. Uh, and uh, we're bringing capital to help uh, hire the right people in sales, in operations, to to help execute against the uh, the, the deals that that the companies are closing. So um, we think there's lots of potential within that space. We think there's uh, a lot of very exciting people that we can work with, and you know the brands are dipping their toes in and increasingly staying when they find agencies like ours that uh, that are delivering the goods. I mean, re- reciprocity is an interesting one, right? Because it's it's more talent and team, right? Uh, you could call it sort of the at the influencer level almost. At the uh, is the goal not just to own the the agency layer, but to own sort of call it deeper down in the stack, right down to the talent influencer level, like to right down to where the brand's sort of messaging will appear. Yeah, I, so yeah, I think reciprocity is interesting, and and if you told me two years ago that you know, you're going to be, you're going to be acquiring teams. I, I would have said, well, no, teams, teams burn too much money. And, and it's just a, a tough, uh, tough space to operate in. The two team assets that are within uh, reciprocity, they're, they're great on the distribution side. There's, you know, 50 million social, uh, uh, social followers between the two assets. Uh, and uh, both of the teams are break even or profitable. And it gives us exposure to two really important markets in uh, Asia through the LGD reciprocity crossfire franchise uh, in China and through R7 within Latin America. So, you know, good end distribution points. And, and we think end distribution makes sense if uh, there's profitability that's associated with it. We're not, we're not trying to collect pennies on, uh, uh, on the dollar within the distribution network. So, so, you know, would we look at more teams that fit that model? Yes. Would we look at distribution networks that, uh, that help get the message out? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, but then the other side of reciprocity is uh, GCN, the gaming community network, uh, which is run by a couple of agency uh, veterans in Keo Wimmer and uh, Jeff Griffith. Uh, you know, those guys uh, connect up with brands. They've got great Rolodexes, terrific, you know, decades of experience. Uh, and, and, and what it allows them to do is connect up those brands, help them strategize on the messages. Uh, and then, you know, particularly with Jeff's experience at Curse Media, they know how to, you know, target and deliver that message at the right time to the right uh, viewers uh, and make sure that the brands are, are really getting uh, the, the most bang for their buck. So, so would you say distribution is critical to sort of the game score strategy or, or it's a nice to have if, if it's profitable, is that, is that how you guys are thinking about it? Yeah. So, so right now we, we contract with, uh, and partner with websites that help us distribute the, uh, the message. We've got great relationships with, you know, 110 million eyeballs or 110 million people, 220 million eyeballs, I guess. Uh, assuming that everything's on average the same. Um, I like but, this way of doubling numbers. <laughs> I got. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm gonna use that one, Kevin. I'm gonna use. Well, that you one. know, and, and and every time I say eyeballs, I I, I think about exactly that. And, you know, but like we're not we're not selling into Cyclops here. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I would say that our our partnerships are are really valuable because we work with great uh, uh, distribution networks. So I would say us owning. Uh, the distribution network is not critical to what we do. I think the the IP that you know GCN and and Code Red in the UK. I think I think that knowledge of esports, that knowledge of messaging, that ability to understand what the brands need, um, that to us is more critical uh, than owning the distribution networks. I think if we uh, find the right assets that we can acquire within the distribution networks, we will. But it needs to fit that profitability and. Uh, and, you know, Justin, who's our new CEO, and I uh, are very aligned in our, our way of thinking. 
you know, he brings a lot of that esports experience and financial experience from, you know, being being at Phase Clan, being the CFO at Phase Clan. So, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about this from a uh, prudent capital deployment, uh, capital allocation. Um, uh, and so, you know, the short version is, would we buy distribution networks? Yes. Do we have to to be successful? No. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, William, jump in at any time here. I'll, I have just so many questions. Um, the, one of the things, you know, I'm curious about is, you know, you guys are public on the Canadian Securities Exchange. What is the, like, what is the, what do the next five years look like for you guys from a public markets perspective? What's the ambition? You know, I get a lot of questions from uh, even individual investors looking to play in public gaming and esports companies, right? And it's a bit of, it's not the simplest landscape to sort of paint for people. There's a lot, right? You have everything from sort of big NASDAQ listed or, you know, New York Stock Exchange listed to, you know, smaller companies, TSX Venture, things like that. Um, where, you know, where do you guys see yourself over the next five years? And how do you look at that public esports company landscape? Yeah, so I think a really important piece that that we keep going back to is that profitability, because I think if you look at valuations right now, there's a lot of talk on sales multiples. And, you know, I, I think that makes a lot of sense early days for companies and, and certainly on the technology based companies where it's, you know, you're spending a lot to acquire customers, to acquire business. Um, at some point, uh, as a, a company that's that's valued on sales, you can turn off that marketing and you can create EBITDA. Um, uh, and, and so for us, you know, it's not really about you know, owning the world and, and this land grab of, uh, of of trying to win every customer because we're on the B2B side. We're, we're working with major brands. We're signing large deals. So, you know, for us, it's it's important that, that we have that profitability. And I think in two or three years from now, uh, that profitability metric is going to become really important to uh, to the, the investing community. So we're just jumping ahead. We're jumping the curve uh, ahead of the curve on on that profitability message. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, that's where we're trying to set ourselves apart. And, and so where do we see ourselves in three to five years? I think you'll see that we are a company that has meaningful uh, uh, revenue uh, that we've grown organically through the investments that we've made within the companies that uh, that we own now. Uh, and you'll also see us uh, uh, knock off two or three uh, acquisitions a, uh, a year. Um, you know, good acquisitions. We're not we're not in a rush to buy just anything. We want to buy things that fit that agency vertical and businesses that are complementary to the agency vertical. Um, you know, we'll, I, I think most companies, when you talk to them, uh, regardless of what exchange they're on, they talk about uh, a desire to uplist, um, and that comes from you know just you know the financial profile that uh, that improves. So more revenue, uh, more more liquidity in the uh, the shares, and so you know will we look at going to the uh, the TSX? Uh, will we look to follow the path that Enthusiast Gaming, which is up you know five times since uh, uh, since since uh, uh, we were kind of comped against them last summer? Uh, you know, will we uplist to the NASDAQ at some point? You know, I hope so, but we're very happy being in the uh, the Canadian market and, and I don't want to run before we walk. We've got, you know, some some deals that we need to announce and, and some organic growth that we need to show in Code Red, uh, 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 GCN and, and within the whole uh, reciprocity uh, uh, family. Kevin, where do you feel that are the, the risks or the landmines for you guys? Like, what are, what are you avoiding right now? What, what you know, where are you making sure you're not stepping for, for a potential investor? Like what, what are you guys, what keeps you up at night, I guess would be, would be the sort of simplest question. Is yeah. it, and I'll just throw one thing out there because I I've seen a lot of announcements recently, which is like, you're seeing the bigger agencies start thinking about gaming and esports, right? Cause obviously yeah. I'm sure they have their clients asking about it. I've always felt that they're probably not that well, you know, staffed, to go after those, you know, to 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 to, to tell their clients how to play in the esports space. Is that one of the things, or are there other things? Yeah, so I I think that's an important one to consider. And and the way that that we think about that is, you know, the the big agencies they have the relationships in place already. Um, and the way that I frame that, you know, I don't I don't, I don't want to drop a uh, drop a name, but it's easy to search up. 
um, uh, one of the, uh, the major restaurant chains globally, they announced last summer that they were going to devote $200 million in extra marketing spend uh, for, uh, for their brand. And that represented uh, approximately one month extra of, uh, of marketing spend uh, for, the, uh, for the year. So like you think about the scale of that. And so when, if you're a, uh, if you're a, a major agency that's, that's running that campaign and you probably don't have, you know, the full two and a half billion dollars, but if you have hundreds of millions of dollars from major uh, clients and they start saying, well, what about esports? You know, there's a lot of risk to that agency of jumping in and saying, well, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna cleave off a couple million dollars to devote towards esports, something we don't know really well, but we're getting better at. If it flops, do you want to be the campaign manager or the account manager that said we just lost a five hundred million dollar account because we screwed up on two million dollars of esports spend? That's where we come in. We understand the space. We're white labeling and in, and in discussions with uh, hmm. uh, with agencies where. We'll take that uh, that business and work with them. And I think that Code Red's a great example of that in the UK. Uh, a couple months ago, we were able to announce that we're the uh, esports agency of record for Bud Light uh, Europe. Uh, you know, and we work side by side with their major agency. I think their major agency is happy to continue doing the uh, the, the traditional uh, marketing, and they're very happy to have us run. Uh, the uh, the esports side because it's something we really understand and we're cognizant we need to fit within the brand messaging that the major agency has put in place so there's a little bit of protecting yourself as the major agency uh, uh, on the uh, on the spend and for us you know the, those those few million uh, dollars of uh, of spend that brands are looking at uh, committing to esports is really meaningful for us yeah. Are there other landmines other than that that you feel you guys are sort of, uh, you know, carefully st stepping around? Because you know there there are challenges industry wide. I think everyone sort of struggles with many of the same things. But specifically for your business, is there anything that you're, you, you know, you guys are conscious of and and are thinking about in terms of risks? Yeah. So I I think even though uh, we're we're smaller than the big agencies, we still need to deliver uh, uh, things that. That, that they're used to getting. So the brand safety element is really critical. And, and I think if you don't understand that uh, as an agency that's delivering for, for major clients, you know, we, we, we can't have the messaging showing up next to uh, next to ads that do not fit with our clients' uh, uh, messaging. So uh, being conscious of the brand safety is, uh, is really critical. Um, uh, I, I think the other piece, stepping away from you know, what we're delivering for the brands, uh, I think it's easy to get carried away in this space right now on overpaying uh, for, uh, for, for assets. And so I think we're very cognizant that, you know, we, we wanna buy quality businesses, but we don't wanna buy them at any price because, uh, you know, we've got a responsibility to our shareholders that we're building long-term shareholder value. So, you know, going out and spending eight times sales or, 20 or 30 times EBITDA just because the space is hot. In a couple of years, we're going to have to uh, 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 reap what we've sown, right? So uh, being very cautious of how we're spending and, and making sure that the business models that are in place uh, are, are, are valid. Uh, and you know, one way that we do that is, is earn outs on the, uh, the acquisitions that we, uh, that we buy. We like uh, doing predominantly stock uh, deals. Uh, that keeps the the folks that we're buying uh, engaged and uh, and on the same page as we are. Now, in certain cases, would we would we look at uh, 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 deals that have more cash components? Uh, likely, but they would have to be really special businesses that have a really long operating history. Well, I don't know if you had anything. Yeah, I want to go back to the overpaying question because I, I understand like earnouts and things are ways of sort of saying, OK, well, we don't really know what the business is potentially worth. So let's sort of defray the question of how you price something. Right. But I, I'm actually a little curious, Kevin, like, you know, can you just say more to the actual because like, this is a really tough market to value things in right there's an enormous amount of growth there's an enormous amount of heat right like and yeah sure you can get some people to defer some amount of payout for a sale but you still have to have some ballpark can you say a little bit more about how you 
judge a company in esports today and how you avoid overpaying for an asset? Yeah, I think I mean, you know, the financials are an easy way to uh, uh, to look at it. It's you know, how, how have they been growing? What's the uh, uh, what's the history? The, the longer the history, the more comfortable that you can get that those uh, those growth numbers are uh, are real. Um, part of it is, you know, uh, Justin and I like to say we've, we've got a no dickhead policy. Uh, we want to work with good people. Uh, and, and so that's a really important piece. And it's it's, you know, you go to business school, you take leadership classes, you uh, uh, you take the finance classes, you take accounting classes. And I think people sort of sort of dismiss the soft skills. But, you know, the longer that I'm in business, the more that I see, the more that that's important. Uh, so it's that that's a way to get comfortable with what's going on. And you can get a pretty good gauge pretty early on uh, whether the folks that you're across the table from are people that you can see yourself working with for three to five years, or are they just after a quick payout right now? Uh, and you know, it's it's kind of that airport test. Do I want to do I want to be stranded in uh, LaGuardia with uh, with these guys for for four hours or you know two hours on the tarmac while we wait? Like God bless, we get to travel again soon. But um, <laughs> and to be you know, fair, that, no one wants to be stranded at LaGuardia. Period. But like, <laughs> ever. <laughs> 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 but but you know, it, it it's it, that's an important piece, and and it's it's building that trust. I I, I think that's uh, uh, that's a piece on that that feeds into the valuation, and and the people that are just kind of digging in and saying, no, we're we're worth. We're worth 30 times next year's EBITDA and we need all of that in cash, but we'll stick around. It's it's just hard to, to, to swallow that. Do you see valuations, Kevin, since we're on this topic, uh, just in the in the esports and gaming market in general? Do you see them continuing to like heating up more and more or or do you see a little bit like of come, coming down to earth? Like how, how do you see the, the trend on, on valuations at that level? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, esports is a really exciting place right now because there is such tremendous growth and we are absolutely in the early innings of, uh, of esports. So I think that investors um, are looking at portfolio of companies that they can put their money into. And uh, it's a little bit of, you know, you're willing to pay a little bit more today because, you know, there's not a lot of industries out there where companies can be showing you know, two x, three x growth uh, on a year over year basis, and I think within esports you're seeing that. So, uh, you know, and and some of the thematic investing, like the online gaming, uh, the the betting stocks within esports. You know, the U.S. is opening up, Canada's changing their rules. Uh, there's there's so much potential, and and so you know, an investor's ability to to you know draw that line in the sand of this is where I think it'll be. You know, they can't uh, because we just don't know. So. I think that uh, the, the valuations uh, are, you know, they're high for a reason. And that's because there's so much growth that's uh, that's supported. You know, I wouldn't want to be an investor that put all of my money into a single uh, a single stock uh, uh, because, you know, I mean, that's who, never who, that's never a good strategy. In, in yeah, any, exactly. In so. Yeah, so you know, I, I think I think a basket of uh, of these uh, esports stocks that that you know do have rich valuations. You know, they're rich because they're growing into it, and 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 we'll see how that materializes over time. It's it's another reason why we think it's important to backstop uh, uh, our own strategy with some profitability, because I think that uh, you know the the trap that some companies fall into is. Uh, when it's when it's easier to raise money, you think that it's always going to be easy to raise money, uh, but you know that could change in you know twelve months time, twenty four months time, uh, and so being able to, to sustain yourself on your own cash flow, it might not be necessary, but it's sure nice to have it. Yeah, even even when you know the cash is flowing freely, you still need to build a good business. 100%. And that goes back to our view of, you know, we, we want to be prudent with our investor dollars um, and, and buy companies that, that fit within our model that, you know, we're not going to splash money around to just buy anything at any price. We will say no to things that, that we just don't think, one, fit within our portfolio, but two, are just outside of the valuation ranges that we're comfortable with. Uh, William, did you have anything before we jumped into some news here? 
I think it's really interesting. No, I mean, I just love hearing how you think about the the structure and the pricing of the space. But let's go into news, Paul, because I think there's a lot of really good topics this week. So, like, let's, we do. let's dive in. We do. Um, in fact, let's start. You know, we're talking about public public esports stocks. Let's let's start with one that was in the news this week. It's Allied, Allied Esports, uh, and the news story here is from the Las Vegas Review Journal. Uh, the headline: Bally's wants to buy Allied Esports for a hundred million dollars. Um, this is, uh, fr uh, actually from last week, but, uh, Bally's made an unsolicited hundred million dollar offer to buy allied esports, uh, for Mo for those of you who don't know, allied owns really two big properties. So they have some esports stuff, including the big HyperX stadium in Las Vegas. And they also own the world poker tour. Um, previously they had done a deal, which was not consumed, um, to sell the world poker tour, um, uh, two element partners for about 78 million. So it looks like that deal, uh, should the Bally's deal get accepted, uh, that deal with element will fall through. I'm curious, um, Kevin, start with you here. Uh, you know, a lot of the discussion I've heard around this is that Bally's really wants World Poker Tour and the esports stuff's kind of an afterthought. Um, but do you draw any conclusions from this, from a, you know, esports? asset valuation standpoint when you see a deal like this? Yeah, so I, I think what's interesting, I, I think you're right that, you know, WPT is uh, uh, is, is likely the, the crown jewel within there. Uh, and, you know, it's it's got a great brand. It's got great distribution. Uh, you know, I haven't seen what the financials look like uh, within that. But if you think about it from the way that we approach businesses, uh, you know, there's cash flow that's in there. There's, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 a business that that fits. And then I think that within that, you're likely getting the optionality on the uh, the esports side. And you know, that delta of 22 million dollars between the reported uh, uh, WPT bid and the 100 million for uh, for Bally's, you know, that 22 could be 50, could be 75, it could be 22. Um, but you know, likely. As the WPT uh, grows, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's going to be slow growth. Like that's a good stable asset with nice optionality within the uh, the esports side, um, and I think that's uh, that's that's likely uh, a good approach from uh, from Bally's because it's helping them on their core business, uh, uh, and then it's uh, it's 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 you know getting into this 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 potentially big growing market where you're tapping into this un, un, untouchables uh, demographic, the, the gen, gen Zs that, you know, they're not consuming media in a traditional way. So you're sort of future proofing yourself with that, uh, with that esports asset. So I think it's a really interesting uh, uh, play of uh, what's a more traditional business and, uh, and, and this up and coming growth area. So specifics of the deal and transaction is like the dollars and the specifics there, the financials. Um, you like this deal, uh, and 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 sort of my follow up there is, like, how do you how do you or Game Square think about the the arena sort of piece of the esports puzzle? Right, uh, it's not obviously not agencies, and it's obviously not distribution. But uh, is it something you looked at in the past and sort of decided you didn't want to play there, or? Um... Yeah, so we're not infrastructure guys, uh, so um, I, I I would be surprised if you saw us announce something around the uh, the infrastructure side of buying arenas building arenas um you know there's a canadian org that uh overactive just announced that you know they're building a uh, a facility here in toronto that that has a hotel attached to it um you know that's probably not somewhere that we're going to be raising money and it's it's not our expertise and and you think about the uh, the amount of money that needs to go into development costs that's that's just not what what fits for us? We we want that high growth. We want uh, to be you know doing the the, the really high margin business on the uh, the B two B side. So I suspect that on a cash flow basis, that deal probably makes a lot of sense, and it is the optionality for the uh, uh, for the for the rest of the assets. William, any thoughts on the? And to be clear, Overactive doesn't really know the esports business either, so I don't know how well they know the stadium business. Um, <laughs> William, William, look, I I tell it like it is. Um, <laughs> a little, William, a little brutal you, there, how Paul. Feel, <laughs> how do you feel about the Allied deal? Right, like we've talked so much about Allied on the on previous podcasts, and 
you know, their plan to sell off all their assets and become a SPAC again. And, you know, now they have two offers for this, essentially the World Poker Tour asset. But, you know, how are you thinking about this orphan sort of esports business inside of Allied? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's good that they have a buyer, right? You know what I mean? Like, I think let's start there. You mean right? like they but... go back to a SPAC plan? <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, you have to. I mean, we've already litigated that on the podcast, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not going to propose that we, you know, like miraculously, you know, revisit that conversation. But I think assuming that their plan, their right strategic plan is to back to SPAC, if you will, we should TM that back to SPAC. I really like that. <laughs> um, you know, but assuming that's the correct case, then it's really good that they found a buyer. And I think, or a potential buyer. And I think the price that's being quoted here is hugely significant, right? It's a hugely significant price that's I mean, getting thrown. We around know here. World Poker Tour was worth something. Yeah, what was interesting yep. about the, like the Element deal. I think had me going. Wait a second. No one's no one sees any value in the big stadium and the esports stuff, which was worrisome, right? Yeah. Um, and now now you have a buyer who wants the whole thing. So like, is this like we're relieved? Like the there's value there, or or um, or do you think they're just overbidding for World Poker Tour and you know? I well, don't know what Valleys is, will do with that stadium, frankly. This is why it's just a really tough conversation to have because the World Poker Tour is obviously such a great asset. Like you just you can't parse out the value of the esports piece in this, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So um but that being said, you know, I think the thing you can see that's kind of interesting here is that the assets are viewed as a group, right? Because if you're a buyer, you can say, I just like the world poker tour, you know, like you have the ability to do that, right? You can say, ah, well, guys, I'd really like to do something, but why this? So the fact that it's the suite of assets that are moving potentially speaks to a, there being some faith in the underlying va value of the esports assets, which is positive to that esports business unit and potentially speaks well of its future, if it's future. And B, I think speaks to the power of, you know, owned arenas as content plays in esports. If you consider that somebody is willing to want to move into this alongside the World Poker Tour and take on that, you know, candidly split management attention, right? Because these are not assets that you'll be able to manage with the same, you know, focus, yeah. right? They want to do very different things. So, you know, it's a little bit like reading the tea leaves here because we don't, we can't see under the hood, but those are my thoughts is I think overall, the fact that a buyer has chosen to take both assets speaks well to the underlying business that might be there, or at least speaks more positively to it, or maybe said better speaks to its potential in a way that I think should encourage us in the esports space. Um. Yeah, it'll be look. It'll be interesting to see which deal actually closes because it's not clear, right? <laughs> it's not clear that any one or either will close um, at this stage. But um, I, I like that there's potentially a future for the allied esports asset, like the esports specific assets, because, um, I, I, like, look, I everyone knows any, any listeners of the podcast know I'm not a huge fan of like the mega stadiums uh, at this stage of where the industry is at. Um, yeah. But I think a failure or at least a, a, a signal that that asset's not worth anything is bad for the industry overall, right? Like the, the, that if that if that asset, if those esports assets fail essentially or no one buys them or no one sees any value in them, this is worse for the industry. And so I, I, I like this, William, for, uh, for many of the, the, the reasons you mentioned. Um, let's move on, guys. Let's talk about something we, we mentioned in the beginning, Kevin, uh, around consolidation here. And this was a story from Bloomberg uh the headline here is the video game industry is consolidating um it's a very long article it obviously references epic buying uh fall guys tonic games uh, the makers of fall guys uh, but they also talk about many of the other deals we've seen for uh where big you know publishers have bought smaller publishers and and jason trier who's the who's the journalist here you know sort of concludes at the end i will just read you the conclusion because that's really what i want to get at um, because it's the thing I disagreed with. I was sort of following him up until the end here, where he says, it's great to see developers finding financial success, but it's hard not to be worried about the long-term ramifications for video game fans and makers. By the time we see the results, it may be too late. And the, and the reason he says this is in the, par the previous paragraph where he says, consolidation seems like a win-win. Sellers can guarantee themselves stability, while buyers get more content to serve a fan base that's hungry for new games. But there are also costs. An industry dominated by a handful of big companies 
could eventually lead to creative stagnation and other symptoms of monopolization like limited choices and higher prices. So, you know, well, he sort of talks about the, the, the consolidation that's happening and he does admit that, you know, it's probably a good thing for everybody. Uh, he sort of ends the article on somewhat of a negative note saying this could lead to sort of a scary future where there's creative stagnation and monopolies and higher prices and all these kinds of things. Kev, uh, William, I know you want to jump in here. So wh- how do you, how do you feel? Oh, no, about- Kev, Kev, do you want to, Kevin, do you want to go first? Or You go, I have my so thoughts. You, you're, Did- you're, you're chomping at the bit. This is what I was excited to comment on. So first of all, Jason Schreier, like, I think it's a great article. I think he's a phenomenal journalist, actually one of my favorite journalists to follow in the space. So kind of shout out. Um, But the thought here, I actually think is more of an interesting one than just kind of like, you know, a a sour, you know, a sweet and sour finish to the article, right? Because it's an interesting point is that the thing we value in games is innovation and creativity and forward progression, right? Like, let's be honest, that's what we care about, right? And, you know, one of the themes on this podcast has been, why are we seeing all the innovation coming from these indie games? Like, why are all the hits like Phantasmagoria and Among Us and all these things that appear, or Fall Guys that appear to be doing something a little bit different or radical, why are they coming from the indies and not the big publishers? And I think it's an interesting point here that the game dev cycles are so long now. I mean, you could be at four years for a triple A title, if not longer, right? Um, the game dev cycles are so long. These waves of consolidations will finish before we understand what consolidation means for innovation in our industry, right? And, you know, it it's actually, I, th- I think, really important because, you know, as I've been a big fan of these consolidations on the podcast, I've said, I think it makes a lot of sense for scale, for economy, for how games as a service is forcing publishers to manage their businesses differently today, all of these things. But it's really interesting to see if this doesn't exacerbate the trend of innovation coming from outside, you know, major publishing houses. And if that is not sort of almost a, th- a threat to these, like like the downside to these consolidations is there's going to have to be more consolidation because more and more the innovation, the you know the people who are branching the interesting making mechanics and brands are going to have to be purchased because they're going to be indie developers. So you know as I read this, is are we entering a new era? You know, similar to how sort of large established sectors, you know, like energy work with startup acquisitions, where the big guys stay the big guys. And they just buy the smaller companies, you know, as they get to a reasonable level of scale. And could this be the future where foretelling for games, which is very different from how things have been historically, where you can have major successful independent studios? William, you sort of tiptoed around the question here, though, which is, do you do, do you believe his somewhat scary future? Do you believe we may end up in a period of stagnation, creative stagnation, no, monopolies, no, you know, higher I, prices? That that's an easy one for me to jump on. Higher okay. prices. I just wanted a yes or maybe, no there. Right. I mean, anytime there's consolidation, there's a consolidation of market power, and we're seeing seventy dollars retail games today. But I I also think games are somewhat due for a price increase because we've been the things have cost the same since you know Toys R Us was still in business, right? Um, you know, but so that's one piece. But I this. The thing I always go back to is, did the people in the space change, right? And I still fundamentally believe that some of the most creative, intelligent people are choosing to work and make video games. And so I don't think the well of great raw ideas is going to disappear anytime soon. I think where those ideas come from, it's possible this moves more and more to indie development because if you don't want to get caught in the treadmill of a major publishing house, you now these options of these kind of middle tier developers where maybe you could go and bring a pet project to life are sort of vanishing. It's possible it bifurcates the industry more strongly between smaller, riskier, you know, leading edge innovators or, you know, smaller innovators and large established brand custodians. But we're not going to slow down creating games and and the quality and creativity of the games is not going to be any different. Um, it's just where that comes from could change. And I think you might be right about that. Kevin, I'm curious, how do you feel about sort of consolidation on, on, on the game publisher side and the studio side? And, and do you, do you buy his, uh, you know, Jason's sort of scary future here? So, so I approach it and, and, and I'll give you sort of the anecdotal uh, uh, evidence uh, in, in Canada and what we've seen with some of the tech innovation. So one, I think consolidation um, where large companies buy small innovative companies is really healthy for the ecosystem. If that's not happening, if entrepreneurs aren't being rewarded 
uh, for the work that they've done. If capital isn't being injected back for the risk that they took to build their companies, um, you know, that nobody wants to enter that space. Why would you start a game publishing company outside of just the love of it if, you know, that, that risk that you take, the money that you put in, the time that you put in, isn't ultimately rewarded. And there isn't the, 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 the shiny transaction that gets dangled there of, you know, you could start a company and in X years, sell it for this much money to a large company. I, I think it's really healthy. And what, what it ends up building is, you know, these corridors of, you know, San Francisco is a great example of it. Uh, and Silicon Valley, you've got, you know, you've got smart people that are building the tech mirrored to matched up to the finance side and and it, it it creates that innovation we've got the same thing going on between toronto and kitchener waterloo uh in canada where you know, uh, rim who created the blackberry i mean kw is this huge tech hub because of the amount of money uh, that people have made through that and it's companies that are being bought by uh, by rim the money gets distributed people are comfortable investing uh, and I, I think it does drive the uh, the innovation, and I don't think it's uh, it's a scary thing. And you know, folks that uh, get get swallowed up by the big companies, some of the really creative people are going to stay there because they're going to get to work on big budget projects. And some of them, after their you know two years of mandated, you need to stay with the company, are going to pick up and leave with a whole bunch of options that they've exercised and they're going to go start their own new thing with their friends and they're going to accelerate that innovation uh, because they've got the capital to do it and the experience to do it and the network uh, 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 industry contacts that, to do it again so this is why you see people that you know the serial entrepreneur needs their first win to create that second third fourth fifth business so i think it's i think it's really healthy for for the industry uh, to uh, to see that happening and especially when it's the, that that public private uh, 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 sort of multiple arbitrage of, you know, as a private company getting bought by a public company, there's a lot of money that gets uh, that gets injected into the pockets of folks that can turn around and invest somewhere else. Uh Kevin, I mean, it's like it's like you just answered for me too. I don't I don't even know what I can add to that. I feel exactly the same way uh, as as someone who helped to create the startup ecosystem that does exist in Canada. Uh, I saw this happen uh, over the last 20 years. Um, there's like literally nothing scary about this. And so while Jason may be a great journalist, I think what this article pointed out is he fundamentally doesn't really understand the business cycles and how they work, especially in you know high growth, high innovation kind of industries or markets. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, this is only good. There's like literally zero downside here. And, and, and I think we're seeing it, right? The, the, as you're seeing talent break off from sort of the more, the bigger sort of uh, more stagnant players, because big companies always move slower. And they, yes, they may get to work on bigger, cooler projects, but they will always move slower. And so the guys who left Activision Blizzard to go create something else cool, uh, this is sort of the natural order of things in all these industries. And you're absolutely right. When you put money in the entrepreneur's pockets, uh, they'll go do their second and third and fourth, you know, startup. And, and this is how, this is how we have a constant pool and cycle of innovation, uh, without consolidation, without dollars flowing down from the big companies. I, I just think the industry dies, literally game publishing, uh, probably dies because you, innovation rarely happens at really big companies. They're just, they're just not that set up for it. Uh, and so the creative stagnation that he's worried about in this article to me is, it's the opposite. If the big companies don't don't buy little companies, if there isn't consolidation, they they will be you know creatively stagnant. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's the risk. If uh, if companies aren't deploying capital into good ideas, uh, because you know big companies aren't a great uh, ecosystem for 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 fostering innovation. I mean, a lot of companies will talk about their entrepreneurial history that. You know, working in a big place, it's like drinking from a fire hose. We're all entrepreneurs, but, you know, they're in a company with 80,000 people where you can't get a meeting with anybody else. And, you know, everything has to go through project managers that are, you know, green light, yellow light, red light. And, and most everything is yellow light or red light. And then, you know, OK, great. We'll revisit that next week, like not fostering innovation. The one thing I'll say on the uh, uh, on the article uh, it may have delivered exactly what he intended on uh, on his, his journalism of it's got people talking. And, and, and that's, that's such an important yeah. piece of journalism is 
spark that discord. If everybody agrees, if you don't write things that are a little controversial, who's going to read it? Uh, and this is why Jason's a great journalist, right? He asked the right questions. Right. Um, I, I just, I thought the conclusion he came, or the conclusion at least he proposed was a little off the mark. Um, guys, before we, uh, before we jump into uh, the last topic here, I just have one quick message. I will say for those of you guys who know me, who follow me, uh, you know, I've been saying one of the fastest uh, growing areas of gaming is esports betting. It's booming right now. You don't need to be a prophet like me to see it. Uh, I have stayed away from it personally up until now because of the reputational risk. Uh, I did get involved with a company called Esports Entertainment Group. I did invest there. We had the CEO on the podcast. If you're a family office, you're an institutional investor, an investor of any kind looking at the esports betting space specifically also, go check out esportsentertainmentgroup.com. They're NASDAQ listed, fully regulated, ticker symbol, GMBL. I will say, um, I'm not, this is just my opinion. I'm not an investment advisor. I'm not selling stock in the company. Do your own research, seek advice from a licensed professional if you're looking to invest in the field. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about one, one last story here, guys. Um, and hang on, we've got, got on tap here. Um, let's talk about uh, Roblox, because Roblox uh, essentially went public today. Um, and this, look, there's so many headlines, there's so many articles I could point to. Uh, but this is the one. Uh, this is the one that I chose because I love the the clickbait sort of nature of the headline, and that is um, Roblox IPO. This thirty billion dollar kids gaming platform is bigger than Etsy, Kroger, and Best Buy. Um, obviously, uh, in their public list, like they did a direct listing, so they are uh, trading today. The stock is up significantly. It's I think it's up like forty three percent. The valuation. I don't know what currently, as of the recording, which is Wednesday, we're talking about somewhere north of 40 billion or 45 billion. Um, you know, we talked about frothy valuations, Kevin. Um, where do you put Roblox in sort of, in if we, if we were to sort of classify the big, the big IPOs or listings that we've seen in the last 12 months, the unities, you know, the, those kinds of things, and, and maybe even upcoming ones that we know are coming, like an Epic, maybe even a Discord or something like that. Where do you see Roblox uh, you know, in that group? Are, are you really excited about it? Do you see risk here? Is the valuation crazy? Just curious to get your general thoughts. Yeah, so mirroring everything that, uh, that, that you said moments ago, uh, I'm not an investment advisor. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's my past life, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what's exciting about it and what's exciting about a lot of these, uh, these companies that I think when they're first going public and whether this is within gaming, whether it's within the shared economy, um, you know, the, the thing that all of these companies have in common uh, is just massive user bases. Uh, and it's really difficult to value that. And, and going back to our last conversation on consolidation, how valuable is, I, I think it's like 31 million daily actives or yeah. something within, uh, within Roblox. I mean, how do you value that, especially if you're able to go out and consolidate, add more games into that platform, and, and you've got a monetization model that, that fits? Now, are, you have to make sure you're right, buying the right games to push into that audience and that they're going to be engaged and, 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 and so forth. Um, and also, like, what are the monetization models that they can come up with uh, uh, within it? So, uh, you know, listen, I, I think the really interesting thing about the stock market is everybody gets to uh, to vote by buying or selling their stock, and a lot more people want to buy it right now than want to sell it. Uh, so, you know, it, like good good on them, and and uh, you know, people will figure out what the right valuation is over time. But you got to think that you know, with that many users and the the, the cost to acquire a new user in these uh, these markets, it's 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 impressive. Kevin, let me just ask you one direct question before I, I flip to William here, because it's an it's an ongoing bet we've had, uh, which was placed on the on the live stream, uh, which, by the way, Wednesday evenings, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time for you guys uh, go check out the live stream. Uh, but the bet was uh, that in two years, um, who would have more uh, monthly or daily active users, Twitter or Roblox? And so today, Roblox is at like 31 million or something like that. Twitter, I think, is at like 150 million, right, or 120 million, some much a much larger number. But in two years, 
I, I will just tell you, I bet on the side that Roblox actually surpasses because I think we're going to see a decline on the Twitter side. I think Roblox is going to be a bit of a rocket ship from a user growth perspective. Where on that bet do you fall? In two years? In two years, yeah. I uh, like my heart. I want to go with the gaming space, but you know, <laughs> to triple your user base, um, uh, you know, and, and and you know, even even without Trump being as active as he is on uh, uh, on Twitter, I think they'll still I think they'll still hold their own. I, I don't think the rock's going anywhere. Uh, so yeah, I, I do think that that that's it's one of the, the pieces that's so difficult around customer acquisition is that you know holding on to your customers I think is a lot easier than uh, than than adding new customers in and it becomes increasingly uh, more expensive to uh, to do it and and I think the other piece there is that uh, you know Twitter doesn't have that um, that 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 age band and so you're gonna you know be You've got some customer attrition as they get a little bit older, uh, and and you're constantly trying to find new people to uh, to come in on the uh, the Roblox uh, uh, platform. So I, I'm I'm going to vote with uh, with Twitter on this one as much as I'm supportive of uh, of gaming. Okay, William, look, uh, Roblox is now worth only two Game Stops. I just checked. Yeah. So this is yeah. A steal, I was right? checking too. I'm kind of <laughs> cheating because the IPO is going on. Or I guess the post IPO boom is going on as we're recording here. It's right? Only so two, two like, game stops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a steal, right? We should I, be piling. Is, hold on. Let me ask a direct question. Is 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 now is Wall Street now like so thoroughly dominated by gamers and gaming excitement that this is all this is basically all we're going to talk about for the next you know five years. I mean, I would, I would hope so, right? Because I <laughs> yeah. want game, like games are. This, this, this is a great way to close the podcast, right? Because in Paul here, I'm going to preach, you know, to your choir, right? But yeah, like, I love games are such an important way that people spend their time today. They're, they're literally like, if you think about many people's lives, they're, you know, they're breaking, they're broken down into work and play, and games are becoming the best and most significant way we play. And, you know, really, there are only two types of businesses that ever form businesses that help you work and businesses that help you play. And if you think of it that way, games have been really underrepresented for a long time in the public conversation, right? Like this should be one of the most important things we're talking about, because I believe it's the future of a lot of mediums of, inter of entertainment, not just the interactive versions of games we see today. So like... Yes. And I, I think, by the way, it's not an overrepresentation because games are hot right now. I think it's like a fundamental correction in games should have had much larger mind share in public markets and in business conversations, probably because they were perceived as, you know, for kids on the Genesis, right, in the basement, you know, the stereotype, right? It wasn't, it was held back. I mean, but I did play in my basement, to be on, to be clear. On a Genesis. Up, but, you know. I bet you were a Genesis kid. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> You know, but like the point is like it's this is a course correction. It's not we're over talking about it. It's we're starting to talk about it maybe as much as we should have been for a while. Um, I love a great way to close the podcast, William. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, how can people find you if they if you want to be found? Yeah, so our website's uh, gamesquare.com. Uh, we're listed on the CSE. Our ticker is uh, GSQ. Um, you know, uh, we do lots of podcasts, uh, do a search for, for the company uh, and follow what we're doing. I think, I think we're, uh, we're in for an exciting ride in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that, you know, our, our pursuit of profitability makes us, uh, makes us really unique. So uh, check out our website, uh, buy our stock and uh, drop us a line anytime. We're easy to find. I love it. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and to our listeners, guys, uh, don't forget, Make sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. William dances every single day on TikTok. He's going to, if you don't follow him, he's going to get sad uh, doing TikTok dances every day. Uh, I'm just kidding. He's not doing dances. Uh, at Busy Sports on all those platforms. Make sure to check out our live stream every Wednesday evening, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time uh, on every platform, YouTube, LinkedIn, everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and don't forget, buy William's book, The Book of Esports. I'm going to keep telling you until literally every listener it's, owns this it's, book there are still more copies guys that can be bought it's this is the beauty of it it keeps getting printed so let's <laughs> uh and and we will see you guys next week